The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Um, today, we will be talking about new capabilities and low dynamics 5.8. Today, we have Henry He, Director of Product Management at Virtual Instruments, who will be giving today's presentation. At this moment, I'd like to pass it over to Henry. All right, thanks very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. Today, we're going to talk about a, another exciting release from the company, and today we'll particularly focus on the release version 5.8 for GDE and low generation appliance. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. All right. So, as usual, what I'd like to do here is before we get into all the details about the exciting features in the new version 5.8, also, I'd like to take a, you know, just one slide, just a very quick moment to bring everyone up to speed and give everyone a friendly reminder of some of the items that, that we had, that we introduced in a recent release, version 5.6 of GE and low generation appliance. So as promised, one slide to talk about those key features. So in version 5.6, we introduced two new series of higher speed fabrics, low generation appliances. They are 40 gig Ethernet and 32 gig fiber channel. So those two low generation appliances support all the protocols that were supported on their most related low generation appliances, namely 10 gig of Ethernet and 16 gig fiber channel before. So all, so all the IP storage protocols that were supported on 1 gig and 10 gig low generation appliances, they are also available on 40 gig low generation appliances. And for both of these two, for both of these low generation appliances, we support a two-core version as well as a four-core version of each. And the more exciting part is that is we support the line rate capability for both of these appliances on across every single core. So if you're in a, if you find yourself either already or very soon performing storage testing or validation at higher speed above 10 gig and 16 gig fiber channel, you you, you should know that we have these two new load generation appliances available already from from the first half of this year. Another interesting thing that we added to the load generation appliance is the concept of direct REST API control to the load generation appliance. And you know, this, as, you know, as mentioned, the main focus of today's of webinar is really for the primary PDE users, right? So for the most part, what you, you know, the way you would run your test is that you have to have PDE installed on a Windows machine, or you know, if you have a API, you have to, if you're an API user, right, you use one of our several API supported, and you're on, running on it, running on a separate VM, and then connecting to the load generation appliance. So one of the trends that we noticed from talking to a couple of a very large a customers with a very large lab and many many different users is that there there is already a, a some sort of automation framework, uh, some sort of third party automation harness that's in place, and the uh, REST API is supported there. So one of the things that they've been asking us to do is to add direct REST API. REST API support to the load generation appliance for both management purposes as well as remote test execution. So what that means now is that on the management side, through REST API, you can get things like metadata information about the load generation appliances that you have in the lab. But also, what you want to do is, you know, especially for the management aspect of it, see the utilization of the load generation appliances. That's one of the questions that that our large users often times to find it difficult to answer when they're asked to you know, provide the specific and actual number in terms of num in terms of in terms of the utilization history of low generation appliances on a port to port basis. So we added that capability that automatically tracks the utilization record on every single port. And so that's on the management side. On the remote test execution side, if you already have existing T E projects that you that you have stored from a, you know, from your team. And you have your own test repository. Then you can re use REST API to launch those, to grab one of those TD projects in the, in that test repository, launch it, pass it over to the load generation appliance, and then run it completely remote, remotely through REST API. And then at the end of the test, the results can be which can be extracted and then saved back onto your own results repository, all through the you know, all through a very common. Commonly supported REST API through whatever third-party automation harness that you're using. 
And of course, every release we want to focus, we want to make sure that we continue to expand and build upon the protocols that we already supported, right? So often, you know, so so often we don't we don't get a chance to add brand new protocols as there are only so many common storage protocols in the marketplace you know, on a year-to-year basis. So what we want to do then, in the absence of any new brand new storage po- protocols, we want to continue to expand on them. So in 5.6, we added NLM support for NFS v3 file locking. We added the ability to automatically calculate and figure out the credits that are needed for SMB2 <clears throat> uh, workflow testing. And for HTTP, we added support for to perform retry options in the event we receive a 503 error from the from the from, from the server under test. And actually, I should probably rephrase it instead of saying the error, because it's, you know when you get 500, it's not always necessary because of an error. There could be valid cases where the server Response with a 503 when either something is, you know, some information is not provided or some low balance needs to be performed or the system is temporarily busy at the moment, right? So, in any case, whenever the server sends a 503 error, then, uh, sorry, 503 response, then we give the user the ability to configure the, 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 the um, the Load Dynamics client to perform some retry operations. And also for anyone who's doing fiber channel MPIO configurations, we added a new MPIO config status in the stats window to provide better feedback to the user because one of the common cases is that when MPIO is not configured correctly, it wasn't very obvious to the user whether that's a case or not. So we added this new stat for fiber channel testers when they're doing MPIO to give you more feed, uh, better feedback about what you're doing and your test setup. And finally, any you know, from release to release, always whether it's, even if it's not an, a, an expansion on the protocol or a brand new low generation appliance, right? We also want to improve the usability uh, in, term, in, in both dimensions, the UI itself as well as some user experience improvements. So in 5.6. We added some pretty interesting stuff. That we allowed, we added a concept of an absolute time step, so so that when you start to test, um, instead of tracking the the time in terms of number of seconds since the beginning of the test, where right, we provide an absolute time step that can be eventually essentially synced to an NTP server, so that you can better correlate the statistics from low dynamics reporting with some with the logs or statistics that you're collecting that you're or that you're monitoring. From the source under test itself, also for a, for a fiber channel and iSCSI testers, we added some custom CDB templates for those of you who use the custom CDB feature. For user parameter file updates, we added some UX improvements there for mass updating. So several other UI and UX improvements that were included in version 5.6. If you want to learn more about it, you know we, there there was a previous 5.6 recording of the webinar in case you missed it, and of course you can always go to the the release notes and take a look at uh, some of the new features that were introduced in version 5.6. So as promised, a one slide overview uh, of what we did in 5.6. So now let's talk about some of the more exciting stuff about 5.8. And also another thing to uh, to notice that for, for those of you who uh, who actually read through the, the webinar invitation emails, you'll see that you know, today we're going to have a random drawing for the uh, for, for one lucky attendee to receive a nice little uh, present, it's uh, I actually saw in person a while a few weeks ago. It's pretty cool. It's a nice little uh, remote wireless uh, MP3, uh, I think Bluetooth uh, speaker. So pretty cool. And uh, I think uh, at the end of the webinar, we can ask uh, Matt to help me out to just you know to actually describe the process of the selection and how it will be announced or contacted. All right. So version 5.8. Let's get right into it. We're, this year has been a fantastic year in terms of lower, uh, in terms of low generation appliances with higher higher speed fabrics. One of the things I think many of you have seen is really the the just the speed for both fiber channel and Ethernet infrastructures. And one speed in particular, 25 gig Ethernet, that is by far uh, the technology with the fastest adoption in uh, essentially the history of Ethernet. So one of the data, you know, one, on the top right hand side here, you see a chart that shows the adoption curve for several different Ethernet technologies that were introduced after one gig E. So one of the and the way to read this is that year one is defined as the year the technology is standardized from IEEE, and then the way you read the curve is that how many ports you know, on the y-axis does the number of ports shipped worldwide, 
and then on the x-axis is the year number of years since the introduction of the standard. So what you're clearly seeing here is that 25 gig is by far the technology that's been adopted the fastest within just a little over two years, between two to three years, it has reached two million support ships worldwide. Whereas if you think about, let's say, the last major upgrade from one gig to 10 gig Ethernet, it took by far, by far many, many years longer. And of course, there are many, you know, many, many different reasons for it. Uh, one of the you know, first and foremost is that when you go from one gig to 10 gig at the time, right, 10 gig was standardized as this technology way, at, way ahead of the, of the market demand, essentially. Whereas, and also there, there was also need to, to, to change the underlying infrastructure from one to support, uh, to support 10 gig from one gig deployments. So certainly those are some of the things that are very different about 25 gig. The demand is already there. The compute power is already there. The IO processing is already there. The network infrastructure is already there in place as well. And, and very importantly, the cabling infrastructure is already there as well. So there's a very seamless and almost, uh, you know, uh, natural and a very, very natural process to, to upgrade from 10 gig to 25 gig. So that, those are some of the key reasons why we're seeing 25 gig adoption be, is so much faster and more rapid than, than all other Ethernet speeds in, in this history. So what are we doing here? We are coming out with a brand new low generation appliance, a 25 gig series low generation appliance by the end of this year. Right, so it's not available right now at the moment with uh, version 5.8 GA, but it will be a version 5.8 service pack in December. This is a fast track to the uh, R&D effort here, and uh, over over the next couple of months, you're, you're going to see this product at the marketplace. It will be a four-port model, and all of us currently support the storage protocols that we support on 10 gig and 40 gig Ethernet low generation appliances will be available on this 25 gig low generation appliances as, as well, and it will be line rate on every single port. So pretty exciting if you already have a 25 gig project uh, that you're working on, or you have 25 gig uh, products that you're testing or looking to test very soon, then you'll keep this in mind that this will be a product by the end of the year. All right, next, what else are we doing besides higher speed fabrics and higher speed Ethernet in general? Well, one of the very common feedback that we get from users as well is, well, I'm running these tests and running these workloads and I have hundreds or thousands, in some cases even tens of thousands of connections, different clients talking to different stores, store servers uh, for NASA, for SMB, NFS, and HTTP object, or in the case of high scale and fiber channel, a lot of initiators and targets. So. As I run through the test, I, need, I see that you know 80%, 90% of the of the you know, of the workloads run as as expected. For some reason, there are a few here, or a few sessions here, or a few initiators, or a few clients, or maybe a few servers. Right, that's just simply not performing the way I expect it to. So I see that as an aggregate, but I don't see exactly which pairs of you know, which can which um, ITLs or which initiator to uh, sorry which client to server connection are really exhibiting these problems. So what we did is to come up with this concept of a diagnostic suite. And there's really two components to it. One is a real-time alert system that runs, obviously, real-time as your test is running. And you get these error feedbacks, diagnostic feedbacks happening in real-time. On the next slide, you'll see some screenshots and better description of it. And then there's also a what's called a post-test summary file, file viewer that will be, that is, for the most, that is about 80%, 90% done in R&D, but that will be released in a subsequent version of the TDE and load generation appliance. So what that does, the summary, post-test summary file viewer, it's a, it's a brand new a software that, that gets installed along with TDE, and that's a, that's a software that you, a program that you can use to open up a summary file that gets produced at the end of every test on the low generation appliance and this is by far the absolute most granular collection data collection um, file format that our low generation appliances is every half second data regardless of how long ran the test so that will be something that will be very exciting in 6.0 version and so you know during the next webinar we'll talk more about it for 5.8 what can you get so in 5.8 Again, this is a real-time alert system. So what it does, it, the way this is designed, is designed into three different modules. 
there's a TCP IP protocol module because that works across, yeah, that's generic, that's broad, that works across all IP storage protocols. Then there's a data verification module, so this is a little different from the connections or even protocol specific. It has to do with data verification itself, right? Anytime you're writing data and you want to read it back and you're seeing something that's different, well, you know, that, that, that data verification module will provide that, that feedback when there are errors encountered. And lastly, there's a protocol module that gets added on to the TCP IP module. So very similar to the OSI layer model, right? Essentially, you know, uh, regardless of which IP storage protocol that you that you run, you have you know, each protocol have its has its own set of errors, has its own set of problems. So you know, we do need to build them one by one as a as an as an add-on, some sort of extension. So the TCP IP module is something that's available in version 5.8, and as you can imagine, it tracks the errors and issues that happens at TCP IP layer. And also in some cases, uh, even below it, such as uh, when you do an ARP resolution. So that's technically not necessarily a TCP layer, but you know, we'll track that information as well. So what can you get? What we will provide is that error for each error that we detected at the TCP IP layer, we'll record a timestamp at which the error was, was, was observed. The source and destination MAC address, the source and destination IP address, the source and destination TCP uh, port, and for those you know, for those of you who are using TDE and you, you, have, you have different scenarios in your project, and then within scenarios you have different actions. Well, we'll track those um, information as well because not only do you, sometimes it's important to know which source and destination ha, you know, produces error or trigger an error. We want to know specifically what actions within that scenario that triggered that action. So those are information that we're going to provide as well. And you can see some of that in the screenshot here already, where you know, if you can follow the mouse movement here around the bottom screenshot, see that there's a scenario action index here. If you click in this hyperlink, when you click on that, it'll bring you into the scenario editor so you know exactly which action caused the problem. So the whole idea behind this concept here is that we want to provide much better feedback to you as a user to troubleshoot when an error occurs. Because really, one of the powers, uh, you know, one of the very powerful things that we do as a product is to stimulate mass scale. Well, the problem with that is if you're trying to find a needle in a haystack, that becomes a now that becomes a problem, right? So this is intended to solve that problem. So the next module, the data verification module. This one I think is pretty self-explanatory. If you have if you have ever seen the data verification uh, results chart that GD provides at the end of the test. This is pretty much the same exact concept, except for now this is going to be done in real time. And the protocol module, this, as I mentioned, this is an item that we need to build for each protocol individually because every protocol is different. So in version 5.8, we're building, we, we added the HTTP ob and object storage protocol module. So for HTTP, as you can also see in the screenshot here on the bottom right, you can get some additional information that's specific to uh, HTTP and object protocols. You get the request method itself, whether it's put or get or uh, or, or you know, post or head operations. So you get a record of that. Uh, you get the specific HTTP status code that was recorded by the server under test while while and while this error was encountered. It will also include some additional HTTP headers, some content length information, the byte left. You know, these are all information that you get from the HTTP header itself. So this is what's being done in version 5.8 and Absolutely, you, know, you can expect that for the next version, we're going to, and so versions after that, we'll add support for different protocols. At the moment, our thinking is to add support for iSCSI for the next version, as well as the protocol module extension. However, you know, this is um, you know, also the, you know, the, the environment where we're looking to get feedback from you, right? So if you feel like, you know what, I don't care about iSCSI, I actually want SMB2 first, then you know, those are the feedback that we're looking to collect. Right, the more feedback that we get, um, you know, we're able to make better decisions that work for our most customers. Um, if we don't get any feedback, we're just going to go by what, what we believe is the right thing to do for the industry overall. All right, moving on up to so talk about different aspects of uh, what's new in version 5.8, iSCSI discovery. I think anyone who has ever done iSCSI uh, testing with the and actually, to some extent, LDXC as well. And I don't want you to go off tangent here, so I'm just going to make one note about LDXC at the end of this slide here. So let me just start by focusing on TDE. So <clears throat> you know that it's not easy to configure iSCSI uh, initiator and target pairings. It, there's a lot of information, and 
you know, sometimes it's the nature of the protocol itself. There's a lot of information that you need to enter, and it's you know pretty error prone. And then on top of that, you may have chat authentication. So quite a lot, it's quite an involved process to configure iSCSI test. So what we added in version 5.8 is the iSCSI discovery capability. For those of you who have been working with a fiber channel auto discovery process in TDE, the workflow here and the user experience here will be largely the same. Not exactly the same, but largely the same. The, what you're going to be able to do is go to the appliances page in TDE and be able to start a discovery process. And of course, you know, in iSCSI discovery, there's some, there, there's some information you have to enter by the nature of the protocol itself. So you do need to enter a specific uh, iSCSI portal address. And that portal address is pretty much all you need to, well, okay. That's all you need to enter on the TARC, on the destination side. On the store side, you need to just specify, you know, very basic stuff, the, your, the, the initial IP address, you know, just in, enter one IP address that is capable of talking to the portal, the iSCSI portal in the lab setup that you have. So something that's on the same subnet usually works pretty well. And then just give yourself one iSCSI initiator IQN. And that's it. You hit the discovery button, we'll talk to the, we'll reach out to the portal and then do a discovery, and then we'll be essentially we'll ask the portal for all, you know, for all the targets and LUNs it knows about, and then we'll collect all that information and present it in the TDE window in a way that, that's pretty pretty straightforward and easy to read. And the UI, as the reason I mentioned fiber channel discovery earlier, is because the UI looks basically the same as well. It has, it has a list of target IP addresses, a list of target names, the uh, list of LUN number, well, the logical unit numbers, the logical unit sizes, and also the block size. You know, the, the, this is the drive block size that is supported by this particular target LUN. So all that information is available in the discovery results. And also in the case you encounter an error, let's say the ISO the portal comes back and tell you, no, you need, you know, you need to enter chat information. So you get prompted with these types of errors as well. As you can see in some of the screenshots, you can also enter these uh, chat authentication information. So once you get all that results, then what? Well, you want to be able to start utilizing them into the TD project or scenario that you're creating. So similar to the fiber channel user experience and workflow, you can drag and drop one, you know, one or more of these targets from the right-hand side to the left-hand side of your scenario editor like you see in here in the screenshot. Or if you use the user parameters because you want to make use of hundreds or all of the ISCSI targets that you, uh, discover, that you discovered, then you can also you know, automatically populate them into a user parameter file in TDE and then make references to it. So as you can see, a pretty well thought out seamless uh, workflow from discovery to project creation. And for those of you who really want to, you know, if you really see a lot of errors uh, during this discovery process for some reason, there's also the option to collect PCAP during that discovery process. And lastly, if you happen to be a user of OTD in LDXE, then you can also export the CSV file and import it into LDXC 6.0, and that will automatically create an iSCSI test bed for you. And this is a part where I want to take a moment and go slightly off tension and talk about the L sim, the very similar concept in LDXC 6.0 for iSCSI test bed creation. So for those of you who may use I, uh, LDXC for iSCSI testing, you also know that the process to create a test bed is also very, very cumbersome, and you know, it takes a long time, essentially, if you have a large lab environment set up. So in LDXC 6.0, well, there's a brand new feature called iSCSI testbed tabular entry. So it allows you to essentially create a large iSCSI testbed using a table. And you can do this table, create this table in Excel outside of LDXC because Excel already has you know, some of the world's most powerful math editing tools. So one thing we can do here is essentially if you're, if you're user of both products, you do this iSCSI discovery in TD, you export the CSV, and then you can import into LDXC. 6.0 that will automatically populate this iSCSI test bed. So you don't have to really do any manual entry at all. And then after LDXC 6.0, we'll also integrate this autom automated discovery process as well so that you don't even have to do the, uh, do the export import process as well. So what they, so on the LDXC note in 2018, we're going to see is a two very distinct and obvious improvements for iSCSI test bed creation. The first, is a tabular entry which also supports export import from the TDE iSCSI discovery. It's a manual export import, but that's pretty much all the manual aspect to it. And then the second part of next year, you'll see an automated disc iSCSI discovery 
process baked into the product from a user's perspective is going to work pretty much like the fiber channel uh, auto discovery in LDXE as well. So very ex exciting feature for both TD and LDXE uh, <clears throat> regarding iSCSI. So for iSCSI for TD users, this is already available in version 5.8, which uh, by the way, I, I'm sorry I forgot to mention, was released about two weeks ago. All right, moving aside from block and moving on to the file size, since I know that you're different Different, att different webinar attendees may have different interests and different sets of protocols. So what are we doing on the file side here? So version 5.6, as you may, may may not remember, we introduced NOM. Well, NOM is just one aspect of file locking, right? In file locking for NFS v3, there's the concept of monitor lock and non-monitor lock, synchronous locks versus asynchronous locks and so on. So for the, for the uh, asynchronous aspects or, or um, of the of the locks, you need NSM to work together with NOM to make that happen. So in five, version 5.6, we added NOM support, and in version 5.8, we now complemented, expanded that by adding NSM support. So now with version 5.8 as a whole for N for NFS v3 file locking testing, essentially you can you're going to have a set of capabilities to do both monitor and not non monitor locks for uh, for NFS v3 file locking testing. And there will be a total of 13 new NLM commands and a total of nine new NSM commands. And just like the, all other NS, no, sorry, all other protocols that we support, we'll also provide per command statistics as well. So if there's one particular NLM operation or one particular NSM operation that is not that is not working, but all the others are working, well, you get that visibility um, through both real time and post test charts. And for some of these commands, of course, we're easy, you know, they have uh, additional granular control parameters that you can tweak and specify for each command. So some of the more common granular controls, such as block, exclusive, offset, length, and so on, those are the things that you can that are exposed, as you can see in this, some of the screenshots here as well. So for NFS v3, for file lock and testing, you're going to have uh, NOM and NSM together for the, if you're up to version 5.8. Now, for some of you who may may or may not be too familiar with NFS uh, file locking and thinking, thinking you know, why am I keep mentioning NFS v3, you know, why, why not, why not v4 for that one? Well, that's because file locking is pretty much baked into the protocol for versions, uh, you know, for NFS versions 4. All right, on the SMB side, what are we doing? Well, in SMB2, in particular, SMB202 in this particular dialect and later, Essentially, what the SMB servers uh, begin to do is they begin to enforce the use of credits and proper usage of credits. Uh, whereas before 202 dialect, it wasn't ex it wasn't it's in the standard, but it wasn't really enforced uh, by by servers. So what that's one of the essential changes that that you know, that, that really occurred after SMB 2.0.2 is that credit uh, the credit mechanism is becoming more and more strict and enforced. So again, in five, this is an area where we have improved, where we have improved over two different releases. In version 5.6, we added the ability to automatically calculate the credits that are needed based on your scenario configuration. Whereas before version 5.6, you need to take out a calculator and manually, manually calculate. Well, based on my current you know, workload configuration, I think I need you know, five credits. I think I need 12 credits. You need to actually enter that yourself and calculate it yourself. So in version 5.6, we added the automatic option that automatically calculates it. But there's but that's only one aspect of it because that's you know, based on the current scenario that you're running. It's not based on any specific responses from the server. Right? So basically in 5.6 would automatically calculate it for you as and that should that will work as long as there aren't any problems that occur throughout the test run. Well we all know that that's not, that's not necessarily real life, right? There are going to be problems from time to time. So what happens if the server comes back and says, well, you know, yeah, you you asked for 16 credits, but I'm only going to give you two. Okay, then what? All right. So the other thing that we did in five, version 5.6 is to introduce the concept of real-time accounting and dynamic adjustment of credits. Now, we have to do that for different types of commands uh, one by one. So in version 5.6, we did a real-time accounting for the compound commands. So in version 5.8, which is the, um, you know, which is a new version that came out two, two weeks ago, we now have that real-time accounting capability for recent writes as well. So you know, these three will uh, rewrite and compound action for SMB will pretty much take care of all the you know all the the most common auto credit uh, credit related 
functionalities that you're going to need for testing. Another related SMB feature that we added in version 5.8 is that the, the, the parameter called number of outstanding requests that is, is now also available for SMB. So this is, a, this is the parameter that's available for Fiber Channel, for iSCSI, for NFS, and if I remember correctly, for HTTP and object as well. So anyway, that is now also available for SMB. So you're going to find that if you go to the reach and write you know, functions in your SMB test after you upgrade to version 5.8, you're going to see the, the number of outstanding requests as a new field that you can start to utilize to create asynchronous reach and writes for SMB tests. All right, <clears throat> moving beyond file for a second here, and what are there's another thing? What else are we adding to the protocols here? So for VAI, is you know, certainly the, extremely it's used extensively by VMware here uh, to really offload some of the storage operations from the hypervisor, from the server to the stores themselves. So there's a, a for a block, there are four common sets of VAI operations. And, you know, we actually supported these four VAI operations for many release, releases now, probably for two to three years already. So what we're adding is in this one particular uh, release, it's, a, it's just an additional descriptor type fill to provide better interoperability with certain devices. So most devices, you know, use the target the target WPN as the descriptor type. Um, however, there are some you know, devices out there that use the the import ID value uh, that option for the descriptor type. So, it's, long story short, <clears throat> that's what we did for the version 5.8 for this particular area. So, if you happen to be the user, you know, the customer who requested this for a version 5.8, then you know it's it's there, it's done there for you. All right. The last thing that I want to, the last feature I'd like to highlight here before we get into a little uh, something, oh, that's kind of exciting, is a new stat called completion time. This is you know, actually it's based on a feedback of a specific, you know, customer that we, specific customer that we have who you know, wanted to get a different you know, dimension to the latency measurement. So latency. Uh, regardless of how we just you know, describe it, or some sort of time-based response, that, that type of performance is one of the most critical data points that, in terms of performance that we look for in storage and also any networking technology or any application uh, technology, really. So the thing about latency is that there are different ways of measuring it, and they're all valid, just different vantage points, different perspectives on, on latency, right? So what we did in, in a version 5.8 is to introduce a new stat called completion time. This is different and complementary to the existing response time that we have. So the table on the right-hand side here and the screenshot on the right-hand side shows you that there is some difference, clearly, between completion time and response time. And they're both important information to have because they give you a different dimension, different angle of the whole picture. Response time essentially is the time between a particular request that you can see in the, let's say if you do a PCAP, you see the request coming in, and then you can see a response coming back. And that's basically the response time, and that's the, you know, that's the existing behavior, and that behavior, behavior doesn't change. There are some cases, in particular, we do a large region write uh, operation, where you could have one request, and then the response coming back takes multiple, you know, it's broken down into multiple packets, and and for some users, you don't consider the request completed until you get the last byte of the last portion of the response, right? So completion time essentially is measured from the first byte of the first request to the last byte of the last response. That is completion time. Right? Response time is no changes there. It's the same, you know, whatever you used to from our products for many, many years, it remains exactly the same. So there's no regression or there's no change of reporting you know, that, that are done to you. Whatever number and re result you have in the past, it remains valid, it remains the same, just that we're adding a different vantage point to the latency measurement. And this is available out of the box. There's no special configurations required. Now, any test that you have before, take the same test, run it again, and you go to charts, you're going to see that 
that new stat in your latency chart. So absolutely no, no new licensing, no new configuration, no new test. You, you don't need to redo your, uh, redo, reconfigure your test. Now it does need to take a phase approach. So in version 5.8, we're able to do it for all protocols except NFS. NFS, it still should be something that the next version will have to pick up uh, as far as supporting this new completion stat. Okay. And on the right hand side table here, there's a there's a table, and you know, this information, you know, this webinar will be recorded. So if you're not able to process all this information right now, you can you know, always refer to the recording later and take it and go through this table here. But ultimately, like I described earlier, right, these are five different common scenarios where you know where the completion time and the response time measurements may be slightly different, except for the first case, right? <clears throat> so. Again, I just want to stress because it's very important to stress that everything you've done so far is valid. The numbers will not change. You know, those response times, they're still valid. You know, the, the results, you, you have them still. Right? By upgrading to the new version, you're not going to lose any track of the performance, latency performance that, performances that you saw in the past. So that now with version 5.8, you get an additional stack called completion time. So we open up a chart like you see in the screenshot on the top right hand side here. You see both the completion time and the response time and see really see how they differ. All right. So that's really all the features that I wanted to cover today for version 5.8. Now before we get to questions and or even uh, leave the webinar, I actually just like to do something a little interesting here and we really haven't done it. One of the things clearly we're looking to do is to figure out what are the demands or where our customers are with regards to NVMe. And we definitely have plans to support NVMe as well. And right now, we also even started a little uh, internal prototype already to, to, to support NVMe testing as well as software defined storage as well as hybrid converts environment. And uh, not too long after that, you know, take that solution to the cloud. So, very exciting stuff here. Uh, but you know, for NVMe, one of the things that I would like to understand, in particular when it gets to NVMe over fabrics, is exactly what are different, you know, what are our customers thinking about, right? NVMe itself as the enclosure over PCIe, that's pretty straightforward. But when you expand that over fabric, well, there are so many options. You know, there are different options right now. The NVM, NVM Express organization standardization. You know, currently they're still working on the next next version of the NVMe over fabrics standard. So the current standard right now is only for really rocky. Uh, it's really only over RVMA. And the standard, even though the NVM Express organization recognizes NVMe over fiber channel, it doesn't really define NVMe over fiber channel. It leaves it to the fiber channel standards organization to do that. So anyway, you have you know NVMe over fiber channel as an option. You have NVMe over Rocky V2 as an option. You have NVMe over Infinite Band as an option. Over iWarp as an option. As raw TCP native TCP as an option, which is uh, up in which is being worked on by the standards body. Uh, you can also have NVMe over native, oh, direct Ethernet from you know, some, some startups that are basically just uh, doing proprietary stuff. Or some of our customers don't even care about NVMe over fabric. So that's also an important data point that we want to have. So at this point, I'd like to ask uh, Matt's help to bring up a poll on your screen. And it's going to take everyone about 30 to 45 seconds. It's very simple. It's three questions. Only three questions, and the responses will be you know the, the results that we're going to share are completely anonymized. You know, you're not we're not going to see which customer just you know, said what. It'll just be statistics, you know, overall statistics that I hope will also help you get uh you know get a nice view about what the industry overall is looking at. So Matt, if you can help me bring up the sure. Poll. Yep, I'm going to go ahead and launch the first one right now. So everybody should see that uh, on your screen. And if you could take a moment to, to answer that question, we'd really appreciate that. Okay, I think we have all the, all the answers. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and, and serve up the next question. So here we go. If we could take a moment and answer this question, we'd really appreciate that. Okay, looks like we 
getting our answers in. Okay, I think think we got them. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close this, and then we'll serve up our last question. All right, and here's the final one. Give you a few more moments to kind of go through that. Really do appreciate your time. Okay. All right. I think we will go ahead and close this one out. Okay, Henry, we're, we're good with the, the questions there. Okay, so we go ahead and uh, share the results. Yeah, we can't, so let's do this. I'm gonna go ahead and do the first one. So there are the results for the first question. Oh, interesting. Okay, and let's do the next question. Okay, and then we'll share the last one. Okay. Interesting. Um, I guess the only surprise I have is uh, no, at least from that from our attendees today, there's no interest or at least not no sure no certain interest on M for MVMO RockDB two, which is a little you know slightly different from some of the things I've heard uh, there, but. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, definitely a very you know information useful information for us, especially especially for me in product management. So I really want to you know thank you for taking the moment to you know, do the quick survey, uh, quick poll here. All right, so let's go ahead and open up for our, you know for questions if there are if there are any. Uh, today's topic is relatively straightforward and and short, so it wouldn't be sub too surprised if there aren't uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, Matt, do we have any questions for today? Yeah, I'm, give, I'm just checking. Give me one second. I'm we'll switching screens really quick. And Oh, and then while I'm doing that, I also wanted to make a comment about the uh, giveaway. So what we'll be doing right. is, um, yep, after... Um, after the the webinar, we're going to go ahead and we're recording today's session. We'll announce the winner um, in the follow up email that we'll send tomorrow with a link to uh, view the um, to view the replay. So that way, we will announce the winner of the Bluetooth speaker. All right, and let's see. Let me just see. I think, yep, I think we're I think we're good. Um, no questions at this time. So I think at this point, we could probably go ahead and and close the uh, the webinar unless if you see anything on your end. Uh, no, I do not. Okay. Okay, perfect. All right, well, Henry, I wanna thank you for your time today. Um, everyone else, thank you for uh, making time out of your busy day to attend and look for an email tomorrow with a link to the replay and the winner of our Bluetooth speaker. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, everybody. And this concludes today's presentation. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Matt.